Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about taps, thread cutting taps. There might be more to it than you know. So I think the original tap was the straight fluted tap. I think they were probably a lot easier to make um, way back when. Now, one issue with these is you have to do something called breaking the chip. So as this thing's cutting, a chip will just come off the cutting edge and kind of swirl around in here. And if you let too many chips build up, it'll, it'll get caught in the hole and bind and there's a good chance you could break the drill. So every, I don't know, three quarters a turn or something like that, you have to back it up a half a turn, break that chip off. But that chip's not gonna leave the hole. So if you're doing a real deep thread, you have to back this thing completely out from time to time, blow out the hole, blow this thing off or clean it off somehow and then go at it again. So it's a bit time consuming. Uh, I think these are normally, most for the most part, these are used in, in, uh, by hand. These are driven by hand as opposed to by a machine. Now years later, um, they came up with this uh, helical flute design and these are really cool because what happens is as the chip's coming off, it doesn't just go straight across the way it would on, uh, on a straight fluted tap. This chip is, because of this helix angle here, that chip is actually going to spiral right on up and out this flute. So really, you could, you could do a pretty deep thread without ever having to break the chip or stop it, pull it out, clean it off, because these chips are just going to come spiraling out these flutes and, and clear the hole for you. So those are known as a machine tap and also a spiral flute tap. So this is kind of a interesting case here. This thing has a left hand helix on it, uh, which actually forces the chips as they come curling off. They do go on an angle, but they go on the angle the other way. So this tap actually pushes the chip, a long continuous chip generally, out the hole in front of it. So for a, a through hole, that's great. Uh, nothing can get jammed up anywhere else. But uh, on a blind hole, this wouldn't be your best idea because all your chips are going to get forced to the bottom and eventually your tap is going to encounter them and again could get all bunged up. So there's three different styles of, of flute. A straight flute, a right hand helix, and a left hand helix. And they all, um, they all send their chips in different directions. So here's something interesting about uh, the shanks of taps. From, from very small all the way up to 3 eighths of an inch, the, the shank is actually just over the nominal size. So for example, the shank on this 3 eighths tap is going to be slightly bigger than a 3 eighths inch bolt and also the, 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 the diameter of the teeth is going to be slightly bigger than a 3 eighths inch bolt and that makes perfect sense because the bolt is, a 3 eighths bolt is slightly less than three eighths of an inch and the tap being slightly more than three eighths of an inch means that the bolt will always go in the hole. Uh, but you can only go, of course, as far as the threads go deep or it, it'll just bind up, it won't cut anymore and chances are you'll break it off. So that's from nothing to three eighths. Then starting at seven sixteenths, the shanks are odd sizes, they're not nominal sizes. And I think the reason for this, I think the reason they've done that is they've decided that these things have become sturdy enough uh, that they can go deeper than the threads are. Um, and they've, they've left this at the maximum diameter it can be and still clear the inside diameter of the threads. And, but you end up with some weird sizes. So for example, a, a half inch uh, tap has a 0.367 diameter um, shank on it. And that's, again, that's just some odd size that appears to be consistent across the industry. Uh, I have no idea who dreamed that up, but it, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Another interesting fact is that from nothing to three eighths of an inch, they don't have center holes in either end. And so you basically can only sharpen them or, or work with them in collets. Um, and then from, of course, from seven sixteenths up, you get a center hole in both ends and allows you to work on these guys between centers. Taps generally come in sets of three. You get a taper, a plug, and a bottoming tap. The, the difference is in the length of this clearance lead-in here. Generally, a taper tap has about seven threads, 
that all join in doing the work of cutting. Uh, these are much easier to get started in a hole. A bottoming top, on the other hand, normally has one or two teeth, and like the name suggests, it's for getting threads right to the bottom of a blind hole. And then in the middle is the plug tap, which generally has about five uh, threads doing the work, and these are generally used for the most of your threading. So today we're focusing in on American National 60 degree threads and there's all kinds of threads out there. Uh, we're going to save some of those for another video, but just to give you some examples, um, there's metric taps, of course for metric holes, there's pipe taps for sealing of hydraulic lines, you know, water pipes, all that sort of thing. And this is really, this is really weird. This is, um, it's actually a quarter inch diameter double start thread with a custom pitch to it, which apparently uh, this was given to me by a buddy of mine. And apparently this was once used in the making of the Canada arm that uh, went along with the space shuttle. So I think this is just something super cool that we can just take a quick look at. A double start tap. There's also left hand taps, Acme taps, um, and a bunch of other taps. But again, for today, we're sticking with the American National coarse and fine. As with all cutting tools or anything that cuts, essentially, you have to have a rake and a clearance in order for it to cut. And here we can see that this tooth face passes behind uh, center. And that's what gives us our rake, that scooping action that makes it want to cut and then behind the cutting edge and we'll show you this uh, coming up here shortly there's clearance built into this so if you spin this thing round with a dial here it's going to start say at zero and it's going to go minus 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 and that's showing you that there's clearance there so the rake gives it that scooping action the clearance allows that cutting edge to cut freely as a tap is used and and begins to get dull it's this leading edge from about here to about here where you're going to see some rounding off, uh, possibly chips, some, some damage, and that's because your cutting edge is just showing that it's getting tired. And there's two different ways you can sharpen a tap. One way, and you can see this has been sharpened within an inch of its life, people, not me, have been machining away at the face to get rid of those uh, rounded edges at the cutting edge. And you can do this, that's fine. You do have to make sure you maintain your rake angle properly. And uh, you can only do this so many times and eventually you're gonna you just run out of teeth. Like I would say any thinner and this thing's just gonna break on you. So this thing's basically near the end of its life. My preferred way to sharpen a tap is to grind on this clearance angle, essentially moving this whole taper up in this direction slightly with every sharpening. And, uh, and you can just keep grinding the end down or cutting it off uh, as you see fit. And you get a lot more sharpenings because you can sharpen this thing till it's you know down to nothing. And uh, you could sharpen this in this way many, many, many more times than you could sharpen it using this method. So I'm gonna take a few minutes now to set up uh, our camera leaving fixture. And I'm gonna do that pretty much off camera. I don't think you guys are gonna be interested in all the, the silly little bits of it, but when it comes time to actually set it up appropriately to sharpen our tap, that's when I'll give you guys some detail. This will give uh, my lovely assistant, Tanya, a chance to have her coffee. <laughs> so we've got our tap here. It's a 5 8 11 tap. And uh, first thing I'm gonna do, it's a four flute tap. It's got the four uh, teeth and four flutes. So I'm going to install this four flute uh, cam. And now this cam can do right hand or left hand. Of course, we're doing right hand, so I'm putting it on the proper way. I've got the proper size collet in here already. Now, if you can see up top here, there's this mark and I've got it locked in at the zero. That's, uh, that's an alignment tool. That's gonna help me set it up so that 
the tap is um, advancing at the appropriate time and then popping out at the appropriate time. Wheel is at center height, the same center as this fixture. This dial shows me the axial travel, so as it rotates, how much the tool is moving forwards. So as this cutting edge here gets near to center height, this is coming plus, 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 which means this surface will be ground minus, minus, minus. And then halfway between the two teeth, you can see it pops back and then starts coming up again. And it's going to do that four times uh, out every rotation because of that four flute cam. So I've done some math here. Um, it's a 5 8 11 uh, pitch, and I need to figure out how much axial travel to give it over uh, this distance here from the back of the tooth to the front of the tooth. So what I've done is um, I divided one inch by 11 and that gave me 91 thou. And this is 5 eighths times pi, which is our circumference, circumference, sorry, and which means the actual cutting angle here or the pitch angle, sorry, of, of the threads is 2.654 degrees. Now, I do know that across this distance here, it measures an eighth of an inch. So I've done some more trigonometry and over that eighth of an inch, I wanted to figure out how much axial travel I should have. And I came up with six thou. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a dial, a test dial on the end of here. And as we rotate from here to here, we're gonna adjust our axial travel until it's six thou. So here we can see as we, as we just come onto our tooth, we're pretty close to the zero. And as we rotate past the tooth, we're coming up to six. And so basically what that's gonna do, it's gonna make the grain of the grinding run true to the actual pitch of the teeth. So now using this test dial, we're going to uh, indicate off the, uh, the cutting, the clearance area of the tap, and we're going to get that running zero. And the presumption there is that it had a fine clearance angle before. So we're just going to recreate it instead of trying to change something. Definitely need more clearance there. Actually, this isn't traveling radially at all right now. So what you're seeing here as this travels minus, that is the actual clearance on the tap itself. And we're going to get that running zero, which means we're perfectly recreating that clearance angle. So here I am rotating up until we get to the cutting edge. You can see we're pretty close to zero. And then as I rotate past the cutting edge, uh, we have about a thou movement there, but we're staying awful darn close to zero. So that's, that's going to be real close to the same clearance angle that's on there now. So you can see this lead-in area, that's the actual cutting area, it's on an angle. The, the tap's been ground down to an angle. And um, what we're doing now is I'm going to dial that in so that that angle on this side of the tap is running true to the table of the machine. That way when we start grinding at one end, we'll, we'll be grinding all of it at one time. We won't be changing the angle either way. So our tap's all set up here. Um, rotationally it's in the proper position and you can see we're hovering pretty darn near zero both as we rotate through the clearance angle and as we travel along the length of the clearance angle. So I'm just going to uh, give my wheel a dressing, get it running true and then we'll be able to go. Incidentally this is a 60 grit, uh, 60 grit aluminum oxide wheel that I'm using today for this. So I've got my diamond dresser here and I'm just getting it up to center height and tightened up. I have been getting some comments lately, uh, people really upset that I don't use wheel guards on these machines and uh, what can I say, they're right, always use a wheel guard. Here we are all set up, ready to cut, the wheel's dressed, you can see this dial showing us our axial relief, this dial is showing us our radial relief, 
And of course, both of those perfectly match what's, what's on the tap now. If we look at this now, you can see a real nice cleaned up finish here. This is our, our lead-in clearance area. And if you look at our leading edges, all those little shiny spots are gone. Uh, the chips are all gone. So it's now perfectly fresh again, ready to do its thing. So we've got our new tap. I've got it in a tap handle here. Um, we've got a hole, the proper size a tap, a drill hole here. I am going to tap this. Um, Something I find pretty hilarious. I've actually had people accuse me of being a liar saying that this process does not sharpen a tap. So for you guys, here we go. Let's see this thing tap a hole. So now I'm going to break that chip, keep cutting, break that chip, cut some more, a little shot of oil in there. And now we're coming out the bottom. It did in fact cut. And there's our threaded hole. A couple video, uh, videos ago I explained to you guys that my dad was struggling a little with his health. And I just wanted to say thank you to those of you who, uh, who kept him in your thoughts and told me you would keep him in your thoughts. Uh, he's doing way better now, so thanks everybody. Well, that's it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, please subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next time.